This video is brought to you by Sayerite. Visit Sayerite.com for all your project supplies, tools, and instructions. Got an old chair with channeling? Watch this video and learn how you can easily transform a channeled back chair with new decorative fabric from Sayerite to give it an updated stylish new look. This video tutorial was developed to show a beginner or a poster enthusiast how to DIY. Why pay a professional to reupholster your old chair? Do it yourself and save. Here's Cindy, an expert seamstress and upholsterer, to show you how it's done. Uh, we're getting ready to start this little channel back chair, and it's in really good condition. All the stuffing is still here, and I would like to measure it right now and see what yardage we're going to need. We only need a width and length measurement, being sure to include enough fabric for the sides and excess for stapling. Back is 27 high. And I'm not going to measure the width on that because it'll just take a whole width because of the channels. There's about 31 by 25. Don't forget extra fabric to make the piping. So the seat is 22 inches deep, so I, need, I know I need 22 inches up the roll of the fabric. The back is 27 high, and the outside back is 25 high. We will have some scrap that can be used for the piping, but it's not a bad idea to add an extra yard to your calculations to cover the piping, and so you have a fudge factor. So if I add those three together, I come up with 74. Divide that by 36, and you get just over two yards. Also, we will use a cambric dust cover for the bottom of the chair. That will take less than a yard. So for this chair, we need three yards of decorative fabric from Sayerite and one yard of cambric dust cover fabric from Sayerite. So we're gonna start by taking off the dust cover underneath. Using needle nose pliers or wire cutters, as shown here, is helpful for this job. And I can already see we have a a broken spring right here that we're going to have to repair. We highly recommend the tack and stable remover for upholstery jobs like this. You can get it from Sayerite. This chair is old enough that it was done with nails and it also looks like it's been recovered once at least. The tack and staple remover tool comes with the upholstery tool kit from Sayerite. We have the outside back completely off and we need to take this batting off uh, and save it because you'll want to put it back on when we're finished. And all of this batting also comes out, but save it also. Now there's cording on this, so that's the next thing that will come off of the back, and then we'll do the inside back. Now that we have the outside back off, I'm working on the inside back. And one thing I want to remember is there's a seam right here and it's only there because they probably cut the fabric a little too short. I don't want to seam there when I put it back together. This piece is also attached right here. And that is the inside back. Remove the piping at the bottom of the chair and then the chair's decorative fabric covering the seat. I have the back mostly released and I'm going to go around and hammer some of these in so I don't cut myself on the nails or staples that are still left in there.
before I pull this all the way off, you can see how they tightened up this back of this seat by putting just one or two nails right in here. So when we put it back together, that's probably a good idea. And there's the seat. It's always a good idea to check out the foam, springs, and strapping of the seat bottom before moving on. We will do that now. This is original to the chair, and if it's possible to keep it there, I certainly would. Um, it's a really nice batting, keeps you from feeling the springs, and it's not something that we can buy anymore. Um, I'm lifting this up so I can see if, and make sure there's no springs poking through here because this is the time to repair that if they do need to be repaired. This piece right here is called an edge roll, and it keeps the wood from, from you feeling the edge of the wood on the chair. If your padding or foam needs replaced or firmed up, consider buying new foam from Sayorite. I'm gonna tear some of these strips off. They're rotted anyways, and see what's going on with this spring right here. Um, if it just needs to be tucked back in somewhere, and then um, replace these. I'm going to tack these down, back down in. It looks like they've loosened up a little bit over time. Now it looked like this center spring was broken, but it's just come loose. So since we took the webbing out in there, we could see that it wasn't broken. And we don't want to take this apart any farther than we have to and um, end up having to retie all the springs because they are still all tied. I can see that. And um, what happened is this came unhooked from the strapping. So I'm going to re-web it here and here and attach the spring back. Um, see how strong that looks and I might string some more webbing through it after I get the center done. We are using a polypropylene webbing from Sayerite, but you could purchase the jute webbing from Sayerite. It is a more traditional webbing used in upholstery. And I want to keep the springs above the webbing. Throughout this video, we will be using the TC08 staple gun from Sayerite. This is a long nose stapler here, but we also sell a short nose version which will save you a little more money. These staple guns work great and are very reasonably priced at Sayerite. And I want to pull this really tight. The short nose stapler and staples are also included in the upholstery toolkit. Usually, for most upholstery applications, a 3 8 inch link staple is best. And since this is an indoor application, galvanized staples are fine. And then I'm going to go, I'm going to put two across here because this uh, strap is in the way. So to stay on either side of that strap is what I want to do. If you're interested in the upholstery toolkit from Sayerite, here's a quick view of what you'll get in that kit. Even though this webbing is still fairly decent, it's, it's old, so I'm going to run another one right through here, through the front, because that's what's going to take the most wear on the chairs, the front. Now I notice that the chair has been, these straps were tied to the springs, which is what keeps the springs in place on the bottom. So I'm going to take the twine and a curved needle and just go around again and reattach the springs to the webbing. And this will all be covered up after we put the dust cover on, so it doesn't have to be beautiful. I'm trying to catch the springs wherever I can and attach the webbing to the spring. I know 
know you can't see it, but right there is the spring underneath, so I've caught it with the twine. And right here is another piece of spring. So I'm going to go through those layers of webbing and just attach them together. I've gone all the way around and then attached. Actually, I need to go back in the center and do this center one that was loose a couple more times, and then I'll tie it off and cut my threads. When I tie it off, I just do one loop through, put my needle in the loop, and pull it down tight, and that tightens it up right next to the webbing. You can tie it off to an adjacent leg if you like also. Now that I have the bottom all secured, I'm going to put this back in place and get ready to cut my seat fabric. Now if we look at the fabric that we've chosen, since it's a stripe, we want to look at it and see if there's anything that is predominant uh, that we want in the center of the seat. And this red stripe looks predominant to me, so I'm going to make this the center of my seat. So I'm going to put a pin to mark the center. And I'm not going to cut any of these cuts here. I'm going to do that as I put it on the chair. So I'm just going to cut a big rectangle right now. Right now I'm just placing it onto the seat and making sure I have enough fabric on all sides and that my center line is in the center. I will take a tape measure and measure probably from here to here and, and make sure I am in the center. Or the other way you can check that is to look at your stripes and make sure that your stripes are balanced on each side. The width of my legs is 18 and a half, so I want the center to be at nine and a quarter. And I can do the same thing back here. Start by securing it in just a few places in the front. And make sure everything is still straight. and snug it down in the back. And now I'm going to put a couple on each side. Now I can take my pin out. Now I'm ready to get the front corner in place and what I want to do is pull the fabric this way first so that this line stays consistent across the side of the chair. And I'm just going to put a couple staples in there. Then this will pull down towards the front of the chair. and keep everything lined up with our stripe. When we put this cording on, 
This is going to come up around here and cover up those staples. This is the old cording. We will be making new cording for this area a little bit later on in this video. I'm just cutting right up along the edge of the wood on the leg. I'm just going to trim some of this off in the back. And then pull the rest of this underneath. And then I'm going to do the same thing over here. I'm going to cut right up along the edge of the leg. until I get to the base of the chair and pull that under also. And I'll trim this off after I get the rest of the back done. And I'm going to do the same thing on this side. Pull it around to the front so that my stripe stays level. This is the little cut that goes along this part of the leg to pull it tight back here. So I'm going to cut along this piece of the frame. Almost up to the wood. But I want to cut it and test it and cut it and test it so I don't cut it too far. That's as far as I want to cut that piece. It fits good around the wood there, and it is going to be covered up by the back when we put the inside back on. So before I staple anything there, I'm going to get the rest of this fitted. So now I'm going to cut along this line of the wood. And this piece right here is the cut that was on the original piece right here. Because there's a big open area right here, we want this fabric to slide down underneath there and be pulled to the back. The outside back is going to come down along here. So you can see how those two little cuts made that all fit in there really easily. Before I put too many staples in that, I'm going to come over here and do the other side. I think I'm going to stop cutting there and start stapling. The back panel will come down and cover up any fullness there, but I think I've got it in place where the back panel is going to cover up anything else. You can see how when I pull down and back, everything there straightens out. And my outside back is going to come down along this line and go underneath the chair. So all of this back here is going to be covered up. I'm just going to put a couple staples in this piece that we left here that's going to keep the seat tight back there. Um, but again, the back's going to come up against that. And before I do this one, I want to pull all this around tight like I did on the other side.
I want this to go around the leg back here, so I'm going to cut up along the leg again. And I'm actually just going to trim all this off. And the seat is on. Okay, we're gonna work on the inside back next and it has these channels in it and those are sewn in. So we have to take them out in order to get these out and have a pattern for our new piece. Okay, I have the stitching taken apart on this side and you can see that it's stitched again right here. So, and this is a completely separate piece. So I'm gonna take it out and lay it off to the side. But I'm, when I take these out, I'm gonna lay them all in order because they're not the same size. The center will be longer than the side will be. And I wanna make sure I put them back in the way that they came out. So then you just have to keep taking all of these channels out and lay them in order so that you can put them back in the same way. So here's what this looks like now that we've torn it apart. Um, we do need to add a stretcher back onto the bottom of it. We don't want to have a seam right here because we don't want a seam to show. So I'm going to leave that um, pinned together because I want to cut that all in one piece from here out. Each of these seams lines up with these seams when you put it back together and you start at one end and so here and then here and then here all the way across until you have all your channels made. If my fabric was solid instead of a stripe I could cut this all in one piece and just mark these lines with a, a pencil or something, a marker. Um, but since we have the stripe, I want the stripe to be centered on each one of these channels. So I am going to cut these separate pieces and put them together so the stripe is centered. I could measure these channels if they were straight, but up here you can see there's a curve. That's, that needs to go around the corner of the chair frame. So I'm going to actually cut them apart and use these pieces as my pattern rather than measuring. And I actually only have to cut half of it apart. So I'm going to cut, I have one, two, three, four, five. So this is the center. I'm going to cut this half apart and make this half a mirror image of it when I put it back together. I'm going to mark these. Um, this is the center and this is the top. So this is one, two, three, and this is the top of all of them. So I get the curves in the right place when I put them back together. Here's the stripe that I used for the center. So I want to make sure I use the same stripe on the center of these pieces. So I'm going to mark that right there. lay that so it's centered on this piece. I'm ready to cut my first piece and I put a few pins all the way around and I'm going to cut this along the edge of the, of the fabric where the seam needs to be. 
But when I cut out here, I'm going to cut bigger so I have plenty to work with when I pull it around the side of the chair. So any side that was seamed together with another panel should be cut along the raw edge, but any side that is pulled and stapled can be cut larger to aid in tensioning when applying the, to the chair. And I am going to number this one on the back just lightly with a pencil so that I know which one it is. And I'm going to do it at the bottom so it doesn't ever show. And then I want to take this one and lay it over right sides together and cut the same thing because it'll mirror image on the other side of the back of the chair. And I'm also going to put a pin on this one to designate the right side. So I'm going to look again at my center that I used on the seat and mark the same line over here, which would be right here. And then I have piece number two, and this is the top. So this one I also want to cut along the edges because it gets seamed on both sides. It makes a, a full channel in the center of the chair. So I'm going to cut it the same size as the original. Um, I cut the top a little bit longer so that I would have enough fabric to pull when I put the piece on because there's only half an inch left here and that's not enough for me to grab onto and pull over the top of the chair frame. No. This one is number two. And I need to turn it over and cut another one just like it on the same pattern. We have skipped ahead here and here they are all cut out. So here is my six pieces. Each one is a mirror image of the other one. And um, I'm not going to sew these all together. I'm going to sew them to the backing piece, and that's going to hold them all together. So I'm going to start on one end and work my way across this piece. Um, this piece doesn't have any big holes in it. It's still in pretty good shape, so we are going to reuse it. Um, if you did need to make a new piece for this, you could cut a piece of some sort of twill, heavier fabric, and draw lines where these seams are. You don't have to actually do this in separate pieces. You can just draw lines and then you'll stitch on your lines that you drew. But since ours is still in pretty good shape, we're going to reuse it. So I'm going to put these two pieces right sides together. and I'm going to stitch them to this seam. I do want my edges to be fairly even when I do this. It is important to pin these sections together prior to sewing. So you can see that I've made a little pocket for the outside piece of batting to go into.
And then when I bring this one over, I'll make the pocket for the second one. Now I'm going to stitch this channel in and I have the back and two of the front pieces. Cindy did not hold the trailing threads before creating her first stitch or two, so they were pulled under the assembly and got caught or tangled up. No problem, but it's always recommended to hold trailing threads prior to sewing a few stitches on most heavy-duty sewing machines. I'm stitching right on the original line that was there so that my channels are the same size as they were originally. And I'm gonna stitch all the way to the end of this. Now I'm gonna flip this over and lay this next piece on top of it, right sides together, and stitch these two to this seam. I don't want to catch in all this other stuff, so I'm going to fold it back. So I have two layers of fabric and the two layers of the backing. If I had to replace this and there wasn't a seam here, I would just be following the line. And I would even be sewing it a little differently. I'd be sewing it flat, like this, with the line under here and stitching right here. But I wouldn't have to fold it all back to get it out of the way. I'm just going to keep doing the same thing until I get all the way across. We have skipped ahead and all the channels are now sewn in. I'm going to leave this edge open so that I can form this around the corner of the chair uh, the way I want to. And here's what we've created channels for the cotton batting to go back into. So I have both ends open. This is the top where the curve is and this is the bottom. And this is what it looks like on the front. And I'm going to add a stretcher onto the bottom so I have plenty of uh, fabric to pull down when I get it on the chair. We will cut some scrap fabric for the fabric pull, or stretcher, as Cindy calls it. This is the piece I'm going to use as the stretcher on the bottom. It won't ever be seen. This seam down here won't be seen. It'll be tucked underneath the chair, underneath the back when we get it on there. When I add this on, I'm going to put tucks in it, just like that as I sew, um, every three to four inches which lets this piece that you're pulling around a curve in the chair take the curve. And I may end up trimming some of this off, but I'd rather have it there to work with than not have it there. The Sayerite Ultrafeed LS1 Walking Foot Sewing Machine is a great canvas and upholstery sewing machine. It is heavy duty and it's also portable. It's being used with the Ultrafeed Collapsible Sewing Table. Get yours today at www.sayerite.com. When I get all the way across this, it's going to look like I added a little skirt to the bottom. A 
A second scrap piece of fabric is required to go the full length. Coming up next, we'll show a very simple way of stuffing the channels. I'm going to cut a piece of this silk film to go around my cotton so it will slide into the channel easier. And this is two layers, so I'm going to open it up. This won't make any noise, so we can actually leave it inside the chair when we get finished with this. To stuff channels, usually professionals use what is called upholstery channel tins. They are rather expensive and for the occasional do-it-yourselfer, a tool that seldom sees use except when channels are required. And this tube goes in this channel. I still have all of these to do. This one is the end and we won't put that in until we put it on the chair. And then this one goes here, this one goes here, and this is the other side. All these little pieces we'll put in when we get ready to staple the chair down and make sure that uh, everything is stuffed nicely. So instead of using the upholstery channel tins, let's show you this little trick which will save you money and we believe it is also a much easier method to employ. By using a shop vac with the hose up against the stuffing, the silk film creates a temporary vacuum tube, compressing the stuffing to almost half its size. This makes it easier to insert in the channels. When I put these in, I want them to be about the same length all the way across and leave some at the top so you have this fabric to pull over the top of the chair. Here's what it looks like with two of our channels inserted and we have two more to insert. We are using the cotton batting that we took out of the chair, but you could use polyester batting for the stuffing if you needed to replace it. Here you can easily see the stuffing compressing using our silk film method. the third channel. One more to go. And after I get them in, in place where I want them, make sure they're all about even at the top and even at the bottom. Then I can cut this extra film off. And there's the four channels filled. And we'll fill the ends when we put it on the chair. Before we start to put this piece on, I want to measure the center, which someone has already done, but I'm just going to go from this, the, where that wood connects to where this wood connects, and then bring this, this seam in the front piece back so I know that it's centered. And I'm just going to start by putting one tack right there to hold it in place while I work with it.
And I also want to make sure that the bottom is centered and I use that stripe as my center. So I want this seam to come down and end up at that stripe. This piece of cotton batting has to go in out here, so I have to kind of keep that in mind as I'm working with these and make sure that they're over far enough to fit this back in. There's a piece of the wood frame right in here that this stretcher needs to go around, so I'm going to start clipping that until I get that to go around nicely. And you can see that I've got spots here that need to be filled. That's what all of these little pieces are for. They go back in there to fill out those spots. So I'm going to stuff that first before I start stapling anything. And I do that from the back. This area will all get filled in with batting to hold all of this in. I put a few staples in there to hold that in place while I stuff it. You can see how that cotton batting fills out that space that you end up with when you first put it on. I'm going to open this up and tack this part of the base down to hold it in place and start working on this side also. There's a spot right there that I'm having trouble getting batting into, so I'm just gonna have to keep pushing from the back till I get it where I want it and get that little spot right there filled out. Cutting slits in the fabric that relieves the fabric that is going around the wood frame may also improve the way it looks. Cutting some of this batting to lay up here on this wood so that we don't have such a sharp edge along the wood to soften that a little bit. The first staple that Cindy used when attaching this needs to be removed so the fabric can be tensioned appropriately. That is not uncommon with the first tack staple.
I'm going to start pulling this, pulling the side around here, and I don't want to pull it too tight because I don't want to pull this seam out, but I do want it to be snug and smooth. So I'm going to start in the center and then work my way up towards the top and down to the bottom. And I want this line in the stripe of the fabric to stay straight and even along this edge. My outside back piece is going to come down along here, so anything that's under here is not going to show. I'm going to just start tucking this around the corner. And there's no rules, just what looks nice. I cut my stretcher to go around this piece of the frame that's back here, so I'm going to tuck these down in towards the back and towards the sides. Now repeat those steps for the other side. And I'm going to use this uh, white batting because I'm not going to have enough of the cotton that came out of it. I want to fill it in a little bit more, and this will work. It must have more uh, loft to it because it's actually working better than the, cotton, the old cotton. See how those gaps are getting filled in with the polyester batting. Now you can trim some of this extra off and get it out of your way. I'm going to trim up this back leg so I can finish pulling this underneath and this to the back.
Once this is done, we can move on. We will be installing the outside back panel next. Before we do that, we need to make piping, or sometimes referred to as cording. And all of this will be covered with our outside back. I'm going to go ahead and cut the outside back before I cut my pieces for my cording to make sure that I keep enough for this back piece and I don't cut it all up. So here's my pin that was the center on the other pieces. So I'm going to use that center again on the outside back. Now I'm just going to fold it in half on my center line and cut the other half of the piece. The next thing I need to do is to apply the piping that was originally on this around this back edge. And because it's a curve, I'm going to cut my piping on the bias so that it goes around this curve nicely and it also won't ravel. So to cut it on the bias, I'm going to fold this up at a 45 degree angle. and make my first cut right here. And then I cut my cording one and three quarter inches wide. Here we are using the clear acrylic ruler, a rotary cutter, and a cutting mat, all available from Sailrite. These three tools make the job of making cording easy and are highly recommended. These tools and a lot more great tools are available in the Upholstery Toolkit from www.sayright.com. And I'm only folding this up so that it will still fit on the mat. Now when I seam this together, I want it to make one big long strip and on this fabric I want the stripes all to be going in the same direction from one strip to the next. So I'm going to turn this top one over and just lay it on there and then when I sew I'm going to sew from that angle to this angle. and that'll give me a strip with the stripes all going in the same direction and the seam on an angle so it isn't so bulky. And you're just turning it over and laying it right sides together. Now I'm ready to stitch this and add the cording. I'm going to stitch my cording seams together from the angle to the angle. Clip them apart, and then you have one big long strip. And I'm just going to lay the cording in the middle of it and wrap it around. There's a tunnel in the foot that's going to carry the cording as I sew.
and the machine will do the work for you. When I get to the seam, I'm just going to open it up and flatten it out so it's not so bulky there. And that's also why I do the seam on the bias because it, it spreads the bulk out along the seam instead of laying it on top of itself. Now I'm ready to apply the piping up around the back of the chair. And I want this to be right along the edge of the wood. When I put these staples in, they don't have to be right up next to my stitching because I'm going to use this flexible metal tack strip to go along the whole edge to apply the fabric to the back. And this is why I want to use bias cording because of this curve. The bias will take this curve much nicer than a straight cording will. And here also, I can just feel the edge of the wood right here. So I'm going to run the cording right down along the edge of that wood. So that's the cording applied all the way around the back of the chair. If you remember when we took the chair apart, this was all stuffed with um, batting, which keeps the front nice and firm. So I'm going to put all that back in. And then this piece covered it all. I think I'm going to change this and use the polyester batting because it's smoother than this and toss this piece. It'll make the back look smoother when it's finished. And this doesn't have to go all the way to the edges, just to cover up all of those bumps underneath. there. Hopefully it won't be quite so dangerous that way. <laughs> I'm going to apply this flexible metal tack strip about half an inch away from the stitching on my piping and each hole on that edge gets a, one leg of the staple in it.
The flexible metal tack strip is great for upholstery applications where fabric panels need to go smoothly around corners or straightaways and a finished edge is required. I'm going to end this where the break is in the two pronged pieces. Use a wire cutter to cut the flexible metal tack strip. Before we lay the fabric on here, I'm going to start to tap these down a little bit so they're partially down before I try to pull the fabric around them. The rawhide upholstery hammer comes in the upholstery tool kit. I'm going to measure the center between the legs here so I get my stripe centered on this piece also. So there's my mark right there. I want my center of my stripe to be right there and I'm going to put one staple to hold that in place and make sure I have enough fabric in all the other areas of the chair. Cindy will tack down the bottom edge with the stapler. Here she is working at the top edge of the chair. I'm pushing this down into the edge of the flexible metal tack strip. My cording is here and the tack strip is underneath. As the tack strip is pushed down, when we hammer it down, it's going to tighten all this up. Use your fingers and press the fabric up against the small teeth of the flexible metal tack strip. And all this extra fabric gets trimmed out of here. It is wise after positioning the fabric along one edge, this is the top edge, to cut away the excess fabric before pushing the flange of the tack strip down more. So I'm going to go all the way around and get it secured like that and then go back and finish putting the edge down. You can just use your fingers to pull that up onto those little prongs. You can actually use your fingers to start pressing it down and get it in place before you use the hammer. Cindy has not yet hammered it completely down anywhere. First, she will ensure that the fabric panels fit snug on all three sides with the prongs bent or hammered almost completely. When she is satisfied, she will then hammer it down completely, all three sides, giving it a very nice finished look, including the curved corners. Since this fabric is a little bit lightweight, I'm actually like using my fingers to get it started better because that way I have to hit it less times with the hammer. I don't want that piece of metal to go through the edge of my fabric. Now she is satisfied. 
and she will hammer it down all the way, completing the finished look to all sides and at the corners. At the bottom of the chair, she will finish off stapling there and cut around the legs. Now I can trim the back around the back legs. And then we'll be ready to put cording around the bottom of the chair. I'm going to use this uh, cardboard tack strip to secure the cording to the chair. So I'm going to cut it in pieces so that it stops and starts. So I want the edge of my cording to be up next to the edge of the wood. The cardboard tack strip comes in the upholstery tool kit or you can order it separately. And then the edge of the tack strip right up next to the stitching on the cording. And when you want the cardboard tack strip to go around a curve, just cut little slits in it and it'll curve. I'm going to trim this off even with the bottom of the chair and put a couple staples right here. And then I'm going to trim the cording off so that it lays right over top of it and put some hot glue on it to hold it in place. So I'm going to cut the cording right up close to the stitching. I'm not cutting the stitching. I'm cut that little piece out. And I can use hot glue to lay that right up on top of that edge of the back chair fabric. There's a groove in the wood on the leg of the chair that I want to run my cording in as I go around the front. So I'm going to staple right up next to that groove. And I'm going to trim the seam off the cording again so I can hot glue that down. Now 
how we're ready to join the back edges together. So I'm going to cut them off so that they overlap by about three inches. And undo the stitching on one end of my cording. and cut off this extra cord right next to the edge of the other one. And then I'm going to turn this at an angle so it's not so bulky and tuck this one inside it. and finish stapling. I'm going to cut the dust cover for the bottom of the chair. So I'm going to just do a rough measurement. It's 23 by 23. Now when I put this dust cover on, I'm going to fold under the ed edge. So it's finished on the edge, nice and neat. Put a few staples in the front. And then go to the back. And put a few staples back here. And then I'm going to put a few staples in each side and then cut around the legs. Now I'm going to cut around the legs. I'm just going to cut right down the center of this leg. Turn all that inside. On the back legs, I'm going to cut down both sides to go around the leg. channeled back chair project is now complete and it looks great. This is a great do-it-yourself project for anyone who has a little bit of a DIY spirit. We're all finished with our channel back chair. Thanks Cindy. Coming up next is the materials list and the tools that we use throughout this project. You will find hundreds of great indoor decorative fabrics that will work great for chairs like this at Sailrite. If you have questions about our products or fabrics be sure to give us a call. Notice that most of the tools we used are included in the Upholstery Toolkit from Sailrite. To see more great upholstery makeover videos, click on a video snapshot here. For more free videos like this, be sure to check out the Sailrite website or subscribe to the Sailrite YouTube channel. It's your loyal patronage to Sailrite that makes these free videos available. Thanks for your loyal support. I'm Eric Grant, and from all of us here at Sailrite, Thanks for watching.